caves of TAG. And TAG stands for, well, TAG was originally TAG Corner, meaning uh, the corner of where Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia comes together. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's like the premier caving destination in the United States. Uh, so there are probably some people on here that know even more about this than me, but uh, I recently spent nine days there uh, caving every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have read these other sources uh, for some more information, uh, all from the Cascade Grotto Library. So you can check them out if you ever desire to read them yourself. Um, but so like I was saying, uh, TAG is the premier caving destination in the US. And this can be seen in the distribution of NSS members. Uh, I just made this density map myself. Uh, but this is NSS members per capita normalized by density. And we see that uh, NSS members are most common uh, around Tennessee. Uh, surprisingly, Montana or uh, Wyoming too, but uh, very few people in Wyoming, so they don't count. Um, and this, of course, reflects the distribution of caves. This is from a Halliday's book. Uh, this is very outdated, 1966. But uh, you can still kind of see that, yeah, there are a whole lot of caves down in Tennessee. Um, zooming in, this is kind of where the caves are uh, in this area. This is from um, Taylor's book. Uh, and we see right there at the tag corner where Alabama, Georgia, and Tennessee all come together. This is mm -hmm. like the mecca for caving. Wow. Um, and this is all because of the Cumberland Plateau. About 300 million years ago, there was a shallow sea in this area that laid down uh, a bunch of sediment. A lot of it was crustaceous organisms. It all became limestone. Um, and uh, uh, now 300 years later, we enjoy the caves from it. So that, what is it called? Stratigraphy of the area kind of looks like this. Um, so there are about 1,500 feet of kind of limestone layers underneath uh, a cap rock sequence of like impermeable stone. Uh, so kind of how the caves form here is so at where like the, the, the top shelf is uh, eroding, the water comes down, encounters the limestone, and then it starts to sink into the limestone forming caves. Uh, right at that like the boundary where the capstone is kind of um, eroding backwards. Um, so you can kind of see it. So this is, uh, this is a LIDAR image of kind of like the edge of the plate. And you can see like the flat, the capstone. So there's this, the flat Cumberland Plateau on top. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it kind of erodes away into the valley floor. And the caves all form on the hill between where the plateau ends uh, and where the hill uh, reaches the valley floor. And basically, this whole stretch is like all limestone. So we're going to zoom in. But basically, like this, this area on the hill slope is just, no matter where you are, is riddled with sinkholes. So zooming in. Uh, wow. This is in the town of South Pittsburgh, and so uh, I went to one cave here, South Pittsburgh Pit, down here. Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this right here is South Pittsburgh Pit, but I'll show you some pictures of it in a bit. But yeah, you can see like sinkholes just all over. And um, I'll go back, but so the cap rock sequence. Uh, is the flat area on top, which is impermeable. And so the water can't go through it. So it, it runs off and then falls down the hill. Uh, and then there's the retreating escarpment. Uh, and that's that's between the top and the bottom. And this is all limestone in the water. Uh, the water runs off the impermeable top plate and then just sinks down into the escarpment. Um, and it forms, generally forms pit caves, which is what tag is known for. Uh, and pit caves uh, are just big holes in the ground. Um, 
This is South Pittsburgh Pit, which is right here. Uh, this is what it looks like. This hole is 150 foot deep uh, and it just goes straight down. Um, and so then what? It just stops? It just stops. Yeah, so in, in tag, kind of what I've picked up is the main, the main focus is on repelling the pits. Um, sure, yeah. It's called, called pit bouncing. So, um, and in caving, there are generally uh, two rigging styles. There's the alpine style, which is, comes from the um, European cavers. And there's what's called indestructible rope technique, which comes from the cavers in the Southern US, so a kind of redneck. Uh, and it's very simple. Uh, so the main thing they wanted to do was repel these pits. So you just take a big rope, wrap it around a tree, and go down. You don't need fancy relays and stuff like alpine caves. Uh, which is like what alpine technique is for. Uh, and the pits are so deep um, that uh, most repelling devices uh, <laughs> don't work for them. So uh, you always have to use a rack, which is what you can see on here. I had to get a six bar rack just for this trip because I've never done such long repels. Um, any of my devices on the super long repels, they're not safe because they get too hot uh, and they can't control the friction very well especially if you have a super heavy rope going on you. Um, and also in this photo, you can see a, a walkie talkie, which the pits are so deep, uh, yelling is like, um, isn't super effective. So, you know, you communicate on rope, off rope with a walkie talkie. Uh, and here's Hardick going over the hole. And uh, this is what the pit looks like from the inside. So this is South Pittsburgh pit, the one we've been talking about. This is looking up from the bottom. And uh, you can see someone on rope there. So they're super beautiful pits. And uh, yep, so Tom, you asked what's at the bottom? Well, in some of them, not much. So this one, uh, it's just kind of rubble on the floor. So yep, so this one, we went down, we climbed out, and then we did a second pit that day. Mm -hmm. um, some of them can be more complicated. So. The next cave, this is the map of Valhalla Cave, and Valhalla Cave is like a, known as one of the best caves in the area. Uh, and this one has a loop trip in it that we did. Uh, so we repelled it in the entrance pit, super, super deep pit, 227 feet. Um, then we went through kind of this. I chose to give this as an example as it had like a lot of different types of cave in it that we passed through, which is interesting. So we had the huge entrance pit. Then we went through like a bunch of contiguous pits. Uh, this was kind of like a rogue jungle gym. So we were going up and down, like with lots of rebelays and stuff going through the pits. Then we went through some canyon passage. And then we were in like a reticular maze of like phreatic passage. And then we came back out in the entrance. So Valhalla Cave. Um, this is a rappel into Valhalla. That's me on rappel. Yikes. Uh, then, um, so the pits, when they're forming, they form over time. And so often they'll stop at like a level. Um, and so like you imagine the waterfall comes down, it forms the pit and then it flows off. So it can create like a passage going sideways. Uh, but then if the pit like continues to form uh, and go deeper like that passage, it will kind of get left behind um, and like it will still exist, but the water's no, not going in there. So you can kind of see this. So, so far across the pit, you can see the rope we repelled down on. Then we came over and there's a permanent line rigged here that we ascended up and we got into this passage. And then we followed this passage into some more domes. So uh, domes are what pits are called if they're not open to the air. So it's just the big vertical chamber Mm -hmm. formed by a waterfall uh, and eventually someday this will be a pit as the uh, escarpment gets eroded it will be exposed and become an open air pit but right now it's closed at the top uh, then we went into some canyon passage uh, and then this is the phreatic passage so this is it wasn't formed by a river uh, it's just kind of formed by uh, stagnant water and so on it forms like super intricate passage without 
any direction. And this is probably two feet tall in here. So it was a very tight squeeze. Um, and then uh, the next cave I'll talk about. Uh, so the, the biggest rappel I did on this trip was Fern Cave. Uh, and Fern's pit is not open air. So this is the entrance to Fern, which is not a pit, just the waterfall goes in, uh, splashes on some rocks and immediately goes into uh, stream passage for, I don't remember, but less than a thousand feet. Uh, and then you get to what's called Surprise Pit, which is an absolutely gigantic chamber. Uh, the rappel is 404 feet. Uh, and basically like our lights were super powerful, but like we couldn't light up this room very well at all. So in this photo, uh, this is actually, they just ascended up. And so we, the pits are, the rappel so long we ascend tandem to like make it more efficient. This one takes about 30 to 60 minutes to climb. But so we put two people on rope right next to each other and they'll climb it, make it more efficient. Um, and like I said, this was super hard to get photos of. This is kind of like the best photo. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't really capture it very well, but you can see that light way at the top is the people up at the rappel station. And then we have some way, someone midway through the climb. Um, but I don't know, I would kind of describe this as just like Grand Canyon underground. Wow. And um, it was so full of mist. So if you had your light on, you could really only see maybe like 20 feet in front of you just because all the mist so to really see the chamber you had to turn your light off and then we like sent people all to the different corners of the cave and had them light up the walls and then you could kind of get a good view of the chamber you were in um but yeah so it was 404 feet i did it in 36 minutes uh and i was the fastest one wow. um, but yeah so fern cave uh surprise pit is in fern cave that's the, the um we did 404 feet there um but it's one of the the deepest pits and anywhere in the u.s um the deepest is also nearby in georgia called fantastic pit in ellison's cave um but didn't do that one um though in kind of irrelevant, but I was actually very surprised <laughs> to see that the deepest pit is some sort of lava thing in Hawaii. Is is that a typo? Is there actually a big pit in Alaska? Uh, there are a lot of really big caves in Alaska. Seriously? On Prince of Wales Island. Um, wow. But caving there is not very active because it's very hard to get to. But um, that is cool to see, yeah. And, uh, so, so I just, on this list, I shaded, I kind of highlighted all the ones in tag in green so you can see, you know, yeah, tag's doing pretty well. So what's it like feeding rope through? I mean, so you're doing that, you have 400 feet of rope that you're hooked onto. What's it like feeding it through your brake rack? Yeah, so uh, for this trip, I had to get a full-size rack. Um, how many bars is that? I have six? six bars. Okay. And, uh, part of the reason why racks are used for long repels is that so you have all that weight of the rope um, going through your device. And if you know some other devices, all that the rope weight will like totally seize up the device. Just like you know, the rope is like just like you pull on the rope with your brake hand to slow it down, the rope is pulling too. Um, so the rack, mm -hmm. if you the full size rack, it's like pretty long. Uh, so when you're starting out, you can spread the bars like way out. Okay. Um, so this means like the weight of the rope is like seizing up less. And then as you get lower and the rope weighs less, you can push the bars up, to get more friction. Okay. So very flexible and very safe. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good a good question and it brings up so we actually had one woman on our trip uh, and she was so light that um uh, she couldn't do the 404 pit or she didn't want to uh because she went down to four bars and still like the rack wasn't feeding and so she would have had to go down to less bars if she wanted to repel but she mm -hmm. had been taught to never repel on less than four bars so 
she didn't want to do that, which is probably a good call for her. What did they use in the Northwest? In the Northwest? Uh, so here at Cascade Grotto, mm -hmm. uh, we generally introduce people on the mini rack. Um, but uh, our repels are not long enough that like any sort of descending device, except like but most descending devices would be um, totally fine. Of course, I would say stay away from the ATC, the climbing. The okay. Climbing, the descender that climbers use just because that is very yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, this is Fantastic Pit, which again, I didn't go to. So this is Adam, a photo from Adam Haydock, who's almost a professional cave photographer, but you can see it's super huge. Super cool. I'd like to do it someday. Um, and, uh, so most of the caves, I, or most of the caves I've talked about have been like pit caves or focused around pits. Um, but of course, there's a great diversity of caves. Uh, this cave, uh, the, this is the entrance of uh, Cedar Ridge Cave, and Cedar Ridge is not a pit cave, it's a phreatic cave, uh, which had no natural entrance and it was actually exposed by a road cut. Uh, so they went back and put this entrance on it. But uh, the phreatic caves, they form slower. Uh, so they tend to be, so they're older and they tend to be super duper decorated, uh, which this one was. Um, it was probably only 300 feet of chamber, but as a, a couple interconnected chambers just full of every formation imaginable. Um, and then um, this cave was also not a pit cave. This is called Nickajack Cave. Uh, oh my God. Cave is just remarkable. Um, goes on a lake and uh, you can just see the way the entrance is makes it extremely good for bats. Um, so kind of the noteworthy thing about this is you can go there in the evening and see all the bats fly out. Um, there's some rare species of bats, which I'm forgetting right now, but they live here. Uh, and you can, if you have a boat, you can go up, which we did. So we paddled right up to the drip line. And then when you look out, you can see like all the bats flying out to go eat mosquitoes and do God's work. Um, right, so uh, so um, in the south, southeast, uh, they have a lot, a lot more caves than we do, and they actually have a lot more grottos too. Um, but uh, caving is kind of easier to get into there um, because a lot of the best caves are on cave preserves uh, managed by uh, the Southwest Cave Conservancy. Uh, and you can, this is the, their website and you can see a map of where their preserved caves are. Uh, and if you want to go visit them, uh, you just sign up on their website for a permit and then you go out and repel the pit and explore it. Um, so yeah, caving is super huge there. Uh, and they have a lot of great, you know, uh, caving community amenities and stuff like that. Um, so, um, and uh, the headquarters of the NSS is in Huntsville, Alabama, so right nearby too. Um, the, the, the trip I went with was uh, with a group called the Out of Bounds Grotto, which is like a, a non-location specific grotto that I got connected to uh, with, through Joe Sepio, uh, who just moved. To Washington, but most of their members are on the East Coast. Uh, and we stayed at a place called uh, Caver's Paradise. Um, so there's this woman called Maureen, and she runs kind of like a private campground for cavers. Uh, so we were there for like the eight days, but like a whole bunch of other groups of cavers rolled through. The Swanee Grotto was there. Uh, a group from Texas rolled through. Um, and uh, we were there during OTR, which is like the caver burning man that happens in West Virginia. And uh, that got canceled because of the coronavirus. So a whole bunch of refugees uh, showed up at this campground and hung out and partied. 
Um, but yeah, so if you're a general member of the public, you can't camp here, but if uh, you're a caver, you can for $5 a day, it's super sweet. Um, I don't know, there's a wood-fired hot tub and just uh, all sorts of amenities. This is their, uh, what is this called? I'm spacing on the name. A badminton, a volleyball net. Volleyball net, okay, thank you. Um, and then also there's another, uh, there's another kind of caver campground there too, uh, over in um, Caver's Paradise is in Tennessee. Uh, and I forget what this campground's name is, but it's where the Tag Fall Cave-In happens. Uh, this is another event. So if you want to go uh, caving and tag, go to the Tag Fall Cave-In. Uh, I think it gets hundreds of people every year. It's happening in October. Uh, and they have their own like dedicated campground and they hang out and party for party for days every year. Um, just so like caving as a as a sport is super big there. So there are all these dedicated caver amenities. Um, so I'd recommend, you know, hopefully maybe you can check it out someday if you haven't already. I know this is where Daryl got his start. So maybe he will tell me about the things I did wrong. Or, nope, it wasn't there. It was uh, the uh, MVOR. Yeah, Missouri, Missouri Valley Ozark region where, where Bob was too. Yeah. In the sea of Ozark cavers. Yeah. Well, that's the info I have to share about tags.